Listen, we are in week three of being mishandled. We're in week three of being mishandled possibly uh, uh, by people. What we've been talking about is mishandled, dealing with difficult people. Dealing with different, week one, we talked about how difficult it was to deal with people who are constantly, not every here and there, but constantly just critical. They're just critical people. Week two, um, we, we're dealing uh, with controlling people. How people try to control our lives and pull us and take us away from maybe what our heart's desire is and for what God wants for us. I want to talk about something. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to them. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in front of you, and I want you to turn to page 721, and uh, we're going to end up at Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 9. This morning, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a difficult subject. Uh, we're going to have a, a great time of communion, but I want to lay out a thought from you, for you from the Bible about uh, dealing with people uh, that are overly needy. Dealing with people that are overly needy. Um, it's unfortunate. There's so many great things that I get to see and do that, that you guys don't as a result of what you do, like giving, uh, being part of, of watching kids' faces receive um, the blessing of, of your giving. Um, watching and listening and talking to people all the time about how this church, which is not a building, it's us as a community of people, uh, are changing, uh, helping change their lives, their marriages, their relationships, the way they look at themselves, the way they feel God looks at them, the way they look to God. So many great things that God does in the people of the chapel community, but also through the people. And one of the unfortunate things, though, is watching people constantly um, because they feel um, stretched because they're, they're asked to do a lot of things for someone in their life that it's constant. Now, I want to make this disclaimer, and I want us to listen carefully, because we're going to dive into some scripture today like we always do. No, we're not talking about going and helping someone. We're talking about how we relate to others that no matter what we do, how much we do, it never seems to be enough how we're in situations with family members or friends or other couples or boyfriends or girlfriends, whatever, whatever the case may be, that they're so, they're so needy in ways that no matter what we do and how much we do, it seems to come up short, it seems to fall, and then we're put back in that situation again, and there creates, and we feel like our, we're stretched. We're stretched beyond what we can really do, but we do it. And this is why I want to talk about it. This is why dealing with these people are difficult. It's because what it does is put such a tension and a stress, the stretching, is it winds up hurting our healthiness. It winds up hurting our healthiness because we have this, this insatiable desire to constantly meet the needs of these people. It's a very difficult subject because it can be misconstrued. What the enemy can do is put that, we're not saying we're not helping people. It can put thoughts in your mind like, well, aren't we supposed, and shouldn't we always, and we should just, and we're gonna look at some things in scripture of balance, and we're gonna look at things in some scripture on how to create a healthy relationship with people in our lives, and some of them in our own families. And the idea that the scripture will reveal to us about how to deal with the people that are in our lives that no matter what, it's, there's this, and this, here's what I want to talk about, the tension between knowing you can't really do more because it's stretching you for your family, your husband, your wife, your family, your friendship. You can't really, but there's this tension because you want to, and that's your heart, and you want to, but then you feel like if you say no after a while, because we're talking about overly needy, we're not talking about just meeting someone and helping them out in a one-time in a one situation, because there's that tension that I want to, but then if I do, oh, I know it's not, oh, then it's going to create this for me and this problem, but the tension lies in the spot where then you feel guilty, you feel obligated, you, you, you feel somehow less than because you're not doing 
That's hard. It's hard dealing with difficult people like that. And a lot of times what I've seen in good-hearted people, someone once taught me a long time ago when I first got into ministry, pulling someone out of the gutter, down and out, pulling someone out of a bad situation, they use the gutter, the street as a metaphor. No one ever said you had to get in the gutter with them to pull them out because it's twice as hard. And sometimes because of our, our feeling of obligation or guilt, there's this tension that lies because you're stretched. It exists in organizations, it exists in people. We could work, we have a very small staff here, we could work seven days a week, 15 hours a day, and still not meet all the needs. So why? And how do we deal with that? I want us to operate from the same position this morning. I want us to look at this scripture. This is our launching pad to dealing with difficult people, people that are overly needy. And they feel like we're feeling stretched and obligated. I want, to, I want to describe and deal with the tension in that. When he, Jesus, Matthew chapter 9, when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Very interesting. When I read a scripture like that, the key word for us should be what? Compassion, maybe. But when I read it, I'm, I'm interested to know because to me, when I read it, when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion for them. It would have made just as much sense. But when I read it, the word that pops out to me is moved. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. Scripture goes on to tell us like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved. There was something about this crowd, something about their, them being depleted and empty that moved him. He just didn't have compassion. It moved him. And that's a lot of times how we feel with people in our lives that ask us for things. Whatever it is, start thinking. Because we've all been asked to do something. I said a couple of weeks ago, the worst thing you can be asked for as a friend is to help somebody move. Oh, Lord. That tests a friendship more than anything else. Funny how busy I used to get on a Saturday. Help you move? I am so busy, I can't do that. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. The word compassion. Very interesting. There's not one word in the English language that can translate the meaning. Splanknon. Splanknon is the word. Creepy? Creepy word. But that's what the word means. That's moved with com compassion. The type of compassion and emotion that Jesus felt for the people. He was moved from the intestine or the bowels. It wasn't like, oh, that's so sad. That's a sad story. Something, it moved him physically. It changed him metaphysically. It changed him biologically seeing the needs of the people. Seeing someone or a crowd in need for Jesus was a physical thing. It wasn't just mental, like, wow, we need to do it. It was physical. The word means moved from the intestine of the bowels inward, inward affection, sympathy. There was this inward thing that his heart just, oh. And a lot of times we forget that as much as we love, as much as we care, no one cares for people like Jesus. No, and I, watch me, because this is going to be hard. It's going to, ready? It's going to twist your head. Listen. No one cares more for that family member, that son or daughter, that friend, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, than Jesus Christ himself. No one does. And if we don't operate from that position all the same, this sermon will mean nothing to you. And it's a short, stubby Italian guy talking for 30 minutes. But we have to understand that when the scriptures talk about Jesus' compassion and his outflowing, some translations call it tender mercies, that it moved him physically from a place so deep, so deep, 
Well, you don't know how close I am to my son and daughter. No, I do. But Jesus is more. Well, you don't know the things I've been through with my son. I do. But Jesus loves them more. Jesus loves her more. Talking about how to learn to deal with the overly needy people in our lives. We have to operate from a position that Jesus cares more for everybody in our life than we ever could. Look at this. So I want to look at some scripture. But Peter, Acts chapter 3, Peter said, I don't have, he's walking up to a paralyzed man, a cripple. In the book of Acts, Peter walks along a need. He sees a need in this person. Uh, Peter said, I do not have, because the beggar says, uh, uh, silver and gold, sir. Arms for the poor. I do not have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. The, The person in need asks for what? Money. What did Peter give him? He gave him healing. He didn't give him what he wanted, he gave him what he needed. He didn't give him what, because the, the, the man who's, who's deficient, who's lame, who's crippled, the man who's in need asks for silver and gold. Peter doesn't run around dealing with overly needy people. Not someone who asks you for a favor to help move them. Not for someone who says, I'm going through a rust. Pe-. We're talking about people that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what mile you go, it's never enough. And then we're talking about the tension that lies in how your heart feels and wants to do for them. But having that godly balance. Interesting that scripture shows that Peter gave him what he needed, not what he wanted. And then just to take an example from Jesus. I mean, it is mayhem in this story. It's crazy. People are all coming to Jesus like crazy. There are lines, there are crowds, they're pressing in on Jesus to be healed. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to be whole? Who doesn't want to be rid of some affliction, especially a physical one? (laughs) It says people brought to him, Jesus, a paralytic lying on a bed. We know the story. They lower him down into a roof, they lower him right in front. The the drive to meet the need is so severe, they remove a roof to get him in front of Jesus. A person in need. We see it in the book of Acts. Peter sees a need. He doesn't give him what he wants. He gives him what he needs. And then later on, Peter heals. Jesus, people brought him a paralytic on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. This is what happens if I'm in the story. Hey, Jesus, good thing. We didn't ask for the healing. We didn't ask for that. We asked for you to walk, make him walk. They bring the man to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus forgives him of his sins. He asks thousands, they say, the crowds, bringing people to Jesus to be healed. Jesus meets the man. He says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. He gives him what he needs, not what he wants. Later in the story, we see he turns to the religious community and then heals the man. Notice the priority. Notice the steps. Giving them what they need. When we're dealing with overly needy people in our lives, and I'm addressing the tension, look to meet what they really need need, not what they necessarily want. It's one of the great joys of this church is doing and partnering with One City Ministries who will be here in a couple of weeks, Mike and Deb Gilbert, because we're teaching a community in Uganda to be self-sufficient. We're teaching a community how to fish, how to farm, we're coming alongside them. I'm talking about overly needy people not helping. Listen, 
dealing with overly needy people and you, that tension is between, always look for what they need and not what they want. It was funny, a, a couple of weeks back, Brandon and I uh, traveled to Haiti. And the trucks and the cargo crates sitting in docks at Port-au-Prince because people just gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and there was no real plan to unearth, to unlock, to distribute. There was no real organization. There are thousands and thousands of pounds of food rotting because there wasn't somebody, I don't want to mention any names, there wasn't somebody thinking, what do they really need first? And then we'll get to what they want. What do they need first? Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven because above all else, Jesus sends the message you need, you and I need to have a personal relationship. Above all else. And he heals the man later in the story. Read it. When dealing with overly, I want to make clear, overly needy people, Overly where that tension lies, where I can't really anymore, it's stretching me. Ah, but then you feel guilty for not. They might even may control you through guilt. Remember that sermon? They may even con control you through shame. Always look for the need and look past the want. Now, look at this scripture. Jesus before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Here's the skin for this story. The night before, he is in a home, and literally people are lining up at the doors to be healed. All day long, the scripture tells us, Jesus healed everybody that came to the door. All day long, all the people that made it to the door, Jesus healed as a matter of fact, it's a scripture that says he didn't heal all. It says Jesus healed many. The nightfall came. But you have to know the entirety of the story all day long, meeting the needs of people. All day long. And the next morning, if I'm in the story, I get up early. I assemble the team. I fling the door open. And we start again because there's still a need. Scripture says that he healed many, not all. If it's me, I go straight back to the work mode. Come on, guys, let's go. There's more people out there. Instead, Jesus sends a message to us. Early, daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. So later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. In the midst of the enormity of the need, Jesus understands I have to do what it takes to keep myself healthy so I can continue meeting the needs of others. Jesus understands I know there's still, he didn't say he healed all, he said he healed many. I understand that I have to have, I'm, I'm self-aware enough that if I keep doing this, if I keep being stretched, I'm not going to be healthy. And in order for us to help people the way Christ would help them, we have to be healthy. We have to be healthy. Jesus says, no, next morning, I got to go away and pray. Everybody's looking for him. It's not like a surprise. I think we forget. It is Jesus. You don't see all of a sudden later Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. He turns around and goes, what? Really? I didn't know everybody was looking. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know everybody was looking for me. I feel so bad. I feel guilty. What kind of God am I? What kind of savior am I? <laughs> no. No. Because he understood he understood what it took. He understood the tension. He recognized the stretching point where it became unhealthy. So amidst the need, here we go. He goes away and still makes priority his healthiness and his relationship 
with his heavenly father. Dealing with difficult people, overly needy people. You have to know and set healthy boundaries. You have to just know and set healthy boundaries. Because one way the enemy will work, one way the enemy will work, your spiritual enemy to your spiritual health and your relationship with your heavenly father, the way the spiritual, our spiritual enemy will work is by taxing you so much, by depleting you so much, by not knowing how to set healthy boundaries that you'll be dragged right down into the street with whoever you're trying to help. That's why this is important. So we have to know and set healthy boundaries. Here's an easy one. Very practical things. Time boundaries. Time boundaries. The idea of time boundaries is saying I can help you. But I cannot help you on Saturday because I know I'm spending time with my son or my daughter or I have plans or it is my day to relax but I can help you Friday. Well, I can't. I gotta, it's got to be Saturday. I'm sorry. I can help this day, but I can't help that day. You can say, I can help you on Saturday sometimes. So I can, that's my day, but here's the time boundary. I can help you from 8 a.m. to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That's what I can do. You will have 100% of my attention and 100% of my strength to help you move that house in a Penske truck 55 feet, which now is about 155 degrees inside of it. No one wants to do that. But I can help you. Because let's face it, when you don't set a time boundary and you're doing something out of obligation, not out of your heart, you're just like, oh, I got to because it's just that. You don't know when to leave. I think if I leave too early, then I send the message that I don't care. If I stay too late, I really messed up my whole day. There's that tension. I do care. See, we're setting healthy boundaries not because we don't care for people. We're setting healthy boundaries because we do care because my healthiness is imperative first to caring and helping others. Time boundaries. I can help you. I can help you too. Time boundaries. You need a place to stay? You can stay at my place for about a week. After that, that's all I'm going to be able to do. Who has ever done that, told somebody they can stay with them, didn't set a boundary, and two weeks later, you're about to fall on a steak knife? Who did that? I mean, not that I'm speaking out of experience. Time boundaries. I'm able to help you every Saturday for a month, but after that, I can't do it anymore. Time boundaries. Knowing and setting boundaries, just like Jesus did, amidst the massive amount of needs, is a way to deal with overly needy people, difficult people in our lives. Setting time boundaries. Here's an easy one, resource boundaries. Let's just drill down because this is what, a lot, this is what creates a lot of tension in families and relationships. I can help you with two car payments. I can help you with September and October's car payment, but after that, that's all I can do. See, because we're teaching people not to depend on us, we're teaching them to lean towards Jesus. See, I can give you $20 a month for six months to help you, but after that, I have to be done. Resource boundaries, you, you, you can use my car, but you can only use it for a week, and I better get it back with a full tank of gas. There's a little extra. That's the Italian side of lending somebody something. <laughs> you can use what I have, but within time, resource boundaries. See, putting a time, a beginning and an end on something creates a healthiness. Time boundaries. Resource boundaries. You can use... Here's a good one. Here's a good one. You can use my lawnmower every weekend for this season. You can use my lawnmower every weekend up until July. We can, let's face it. What happens is, not that, not that I, I would ever do this, but if I got my mower back and I looked at it and how I live it and I want to help people and I want to be there for people because we should live outside ourselves as Christ followers. The, the circle of influence as a believer in Christ, just so we're clear, should be going outward, not inward. I want to make sure everybody hears what I'm saying. The circle of influence as we influence our community and our families and our schools for Jesus, the circle should be going outward. We have to learn more and more day after day to live outside ourselves. But the way we get the biblical model 
is dealing with boundaries. Because if you get the mower back and you're like me, I'm like, how come, how come he didn't wash out the grass? I mean, because that's what you do when you mow your lawn. You hose down the mower. How's it? See, the idea is, if there's not a boundary, the enemy will stretch you to the point where you become unhealthy. And we're already dealing with an unhealthy situation. That's why we're helping, aren't we? That's why boundaries are so important. Dealing with difficult people, overly needy, addressing the tension of, this is really stretching me, I can't do more, but if I say no, I start to feel guilty. <laughs> if I say no, oh, who's going to help them? Who's going to be there for them? We started the sermon with nobody cares more for people than who? And we've already are the hands and feet. We're talking about overly needy people. <laughs> can't tell you how many marriages and relationships have been burned and hurt by thinking that we were the only way they were ever gonna to come to Christ. We were the only way, so we did things and we crossed boundaries we shouldn't have crossed because we thought, oh, well, I've did, they're listening to me. They're get, I'm getting through. Hmm. I wanna show us something. It's gonna twist our heads, right? <laughs> ready, get ready. And I would love, because this will bring up some old good roots for me, I would love for all of us to read this together. One, two, three. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What? The Lord's Prayer? And we're talking about dealing with difficult people that are overly needy? I want us to see something. Sometimes we'll miss. Huh. Oh, man. I want you guys to get this. Give us today our daily bread deals with today our needs of today. From the most minute need, daily bread, to the biggest need that we have. Give us this day our daily bread, today. The prayer, to, and when he taught his disciples, when you pray, this is how he taught them to pray. What a model. Today, today's daily bread. Give us today our daily bread deals with today and our needs for today. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. In some translations, it's sins. It deals with our past. Forgive us of those things that I've done to others and that I've done to me. So the prayer deals with today. It addresses the past. Forgive us our sins as we forgive, forgive those who sinned against us. So the prayer deals with the past. It deals with the present and then it deals with the future and lead us not into temptation. The prayer is brilliant. What Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, you and me, is we trust and we give all of our life to him. We trust and we give all of our life to him. And that includes the people. That includes the people that no matter what we do, there's still a gap. There's still a chasm to what needs to be done. And that's where I trust God in the gaps. Because really what winds up happening, really what winds up happening when we feel this insatiable appetite to do more and more, it winds up becoming an issue of whether or not we really trust God with that person or not. That's what it comes down to. Because I'm doing what I can and I'm stretched So even in the prayer, the Lord's prayer, I, you're trusting, Jesus says, when you pray, trust all of life to me, which includes the people that no matter what we do, they're still in need. Will you trust them in that gap? You trust Jesus in that gap. Now it's an issue of trust. 
while the worship team plays as we get ready to receive communion. This morning when we're thinking the symbol of his body bruised and, as to, of, and juice of, of symbol of his blood shed for everything. A person with that level of dedication and love I can trust with everything in my life. A person with that dedication of love and sacrifice I can trust with those needy people in my life. And the tension in that you bring them to the cross this morning. You bring them to the communion table this morning and you hand them over at a level that you've never done before. Because it's all of life. And those people that no matter what the tension, no matter what the tension exists, you bring them and you say, Lord, I hand them over to you this morning. I've done what I can. I can't do any more. I'm being stretched. I'm in an unhealthy spot now. I can't do that. I hand them to you. As the worship team plays, you pray about your past, your present, and your future. Handing that over to Christ. And then that person that we need to trust for God to work in their life.